Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, energy seminar. I'm glad you made it through flooding and power outages and internet outages. I barely made it myself. Uh, today, um, we have a great speaker. We owe a great debt of data to gra gratitude to the uh, colleagues in the Sustainable Finance Initiative here, Alicia Seiger and Katie Taflin, for letting us know that today's speaker, uh, Alex Clark, who a lot of us have heard about but not met, at this point, that he was going to be in town this week to meet with some of the people at SFI and others around Stanford. Um, Alex is a uh, senior researcher at the Smith School of, get this title, Enterprise and Sustainability. You know, we're trying to start our new sustainability school here. We may take some advice from you on, on that one. Uh, but it, actually, even before COVID, but especially now, is kind of a world citizen. So he spent time and done research with people at uh, Harvard, the Boston University, Columbia University, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, and as I'll describe today, uh, several groups in China. And he's kind of a, a, um, uh, a um, frontier opener in the sustainable finance uh, community and has been so for a while. And what he's got onto now is something you may not think about as being crucially important but if you look at the numbers, uh, what to do about the existing installed fossil fuel uh, uh, capacity base, particularly large coal fire plant plants, is a very high priority in transition planning. And what he's going to talk about today is his most recent work on, on basically figuring out ways to provide some incentives for coal fire power plants uh, financed by the Chinese government but in other uh, countries uh, pursuant to the Belt, uh, Belt and Road Initiative to figure out how to get those, provide incentives for those to um, basically shut down sooner than they otherwise would, which in my view is a very high leverage way to get to closer to net zero sooner rather than later. So without further ado, uh, Alex Clark. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased and honored to be here and that for that very over generous introduction that's going to be hard to live up to um, but it's a horrible day out there so thank you for for being here in person and hello to everyone online uh, so I've in previous versions of this talk I've um, they've been slightly longer so I apologize in advance if I need to skip over anything or accelerate little bits but um, we can always come back to that in Q&A um, so this this work that I'll I'll take you through um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the co-authors listed on the front here. So Cecilia Springer, who's Assistant Director of the Global China Initiative at Boston University. That's one of the leading uh, sort of academia think tanks on China's overseas investment footprint, as well as Abhinav Jindal of uh, NTPC, which is a, a large Indian utility and also the Indoor School of Management. Uh, Girish Shumali, um, who until quite recently was actually here at Stanford and previously at the Climate Policy Initiative as well, and Ryan Rafferty uh, at Oxford, who um, contributed uh, perhaps the most important part of this analysis, which is the political economy piece. Um, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes explaining what I will be talking about and why we think it's important. As um, most of you have probably read in some shape or form, um, coal power is among the most important targets for decarbonization, um, particularly in the short term. The power sector is, is one of those areas of the economy where it's relatively clear how we're going to get to, to zero net zero emissions. Um, but coal power in particular is perhaps one of the most um, the biggest time bombs when it comes to the remaining um, carbon emissions budget. And according to various organizations, I think the numbers quoted here are the International Energy Agency, but there are various different analyses that show versions of the same thing. Unabated coal power, meaning coal power without carbon capture and storage, must be phased out by around 2040 for one and a half degrees to be remotely feasible. And you can have a whole other conversation about whether it's feasible at all at this point. Um, much of the global coal fleet operates in regulated markets, and that's a sort of catch-all term for uh, plants that are not operating in a totally liberalized market environment. So there are some controls on prices somewhere, there are some controls on how the, the electricity tariffs are set. Uh, it's not essentially operating in a completely free market, and that's true of about 90% of existing coal, um, 
coal-fired power plant by capacity. Um, early retirement is not a particularly new subject um, when we're talking about coal and various different models have been developed and they're actually being implemented in several markets, important markets around the world, including the US, particularly in the Southwest, the UK and Germany. And coal use globally, at least at the time of writing, and you know, obviously energy markets are all over the place at the moment, but there's a clear trend downwards and coal is becoming harder and harder to ensure, both in mining and, and coal power plants and so on. But it's the non OECD and OECD meaning the kind of group of wealthy countries. Um, Non-OECD coal fleets are the subject of this analysis and they are larger in terms of fleet size, they're younger, they're more competitive using more advanced technologies, they're more vulnerable to asset stranding meaning that um, it's quite likely that the investors in those plants will have to take a loss at some point if um, the aforementioned targets are going to be met and they operate in less free markets. And all of those things combined mean they're actually much, much more difficult to retire. And really, although the low-hanging fruit is, is well on its way to being picked, um, it's these really difficult to retire plants that really do need attention at this point. I'll just quickly go through um, some of the things you might want to consider when you're designing a mechanism to help retire a plant early. Um, and it's the, the most important thing to bear in mind is when you're closing down a coal plant earlier than, than was expected, someone somewhere is probably going to have to take a hit for that in terms of lower returns or an asset stranding cost, whether that's borne by the company that invested in it or built it, or whether it's the government that's effectively bailing someone out in order to, for early retirement to be achieved. So three, three main features are important. Firstly, who are the lenders and who are the sponsors? The sponsors are essentially those who hold the equity piece of the, um, of the project. They could be a state and enterprise, SOE shorthand, could be a private firm, could be a government, could be a joint venture between a government and a private firm, could be a state bank. There are loads of different combinations. On the tariff side, meaning that the, the tariff that the coal, pla coal power plant receives when it's operating and selling electricity is also very important. You know, what are the fixed and variable components? How much does that reflect recovery of the costs required to build the plant? How much profit is it making? All those sorts of things. And finally, access to financial instruments in the market in which you're operating. So if you're talking about the US, securitization, which is essentially the bundling together of assets for many reasons, including pooling of risk, is something you can do relatively easily. Um, but if you're talking about Vietnam or Indonesia, Securitization is not impossible, but it doesn't have much precedent in those markets, particularly for large assets like coal plants. Um, same thing applies for, for bond markets, green bond markets, and SPVs, which is shorthand for special purpose vehicles. So, you know, it's not to say that, um, that in uh, non-OECD markets you can't do all these things, but they may be much more difficult to do, particularly at a reasonable cost. So the, some of the key features uh, that really do influence whether something like this is possible in reality are um, the terms of the contracts under which the power plants operate. A PPA, which I refer to in this slide, is a power purchase agreement. And for most of the plants in Southeast Asia, and I'm saying Southeast Asia because that's most of the focus of this study, are just the terms are simply not known. So they're not public. It's not possible, really, without a lot of guesswork and some really uh, good investigative research to figure out exactly um, what contracts these plants are operating under. So there's, there's a, quite a lot of guesswork involved, as you'll see in the following slides. Um, so when you're considering all these factors, you've basically got three options. Number one is to refinance. Um, what that means is essentially taking, um, taking one loan, borrowing at a lower rate, and then using that borrowing at a lower rate, interest rate, I mean, to pay off the original loan, and you just end up paying less interest. What that does in practice is it, it frees up a bunch of um, cash flow that you didn't have before, and you can either use that to pay down your debt more quickly and therefore potentially retire earlier than, than before. Um, or, as in option two, you can use it at least partly to invest in something new. So the other part of the puzzle, you know, what, the reason that we're retiring coal in the first place is to avoid emissions, but in most of the countries that have built coal recently, electricity demand is growing very rapidly, most likely at more than 10% a year. 
And so just retiring capacity is not an option. You've got to find ways of replacing it with something else. And the third option, which actually is probably most front of mind at the moment in the international community, is the acquisition model, where you take a financial asset, in this case a coal plant, whether it's the debt or the equity or both, and you sell it to someone else. And that someone else, in some of the mechanisms being touted by the Asian Development Bank and the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, or JETPs, that you may have seen in the news recently, particularly with respect to Indonesia, um, involve the transfer of an asset into a new uh, financial vehicle that's set up specifically for the purpose of retiring plants early. And that would usually involve some sort of combination of private money uh, from commercial banks and what's called concessional money, um, which would be um, capital with a much lower interest rate uh, that may come from, from development banks, the World Bank, for example, but also, also regional banks or even national development banks. Um, I'll maybe come back to some of the examples of coal retirement mechanisms around the world today, but probably the most important of, of these is the energy transition mechanism at the bottom here, which is the still in an early stage, but it's um, being explored in quite some detail by the Asian Development Bank as a way of retiring um, mostly older coal plants in Southeast Asia. And um, I think we'll skip those, but, but this one, JetP, which I just mentioned. So um, JetP is not a whole, it's not a particularly new idea at this stage. It was first, I think, touted as a potential solution in South Africa. Um, then Indonesia and most recently Vietnam and um, you know I wouldn't necessarily call a JetP a retirement mechanism it's more a sort of general package of potential ways of getting around um, the gap between uh, commitments at the national level by countries that don't yet have means to meet them and typically involves some combination of finding ways to retire coal early and accelerate the deployment of renewables. I'm a little skeptical about the the numbers being thrown around by various people high up in the US government. Um, the, the, the particular number for the Indonesia JetP, which was publicized with great fanfare towards the end of last year, was there is, you know, the US and, and others, including commercial banks, are putting $20 billion into helping Indonesia transition. If you look at the details, there's not a lot of that as grants, most of it is loans, and most of it is not new money. Um, so although it's probably a positive development, I think we should be a little circumspect about the, what it might be achieving additionally to what's already in motion. Um, and it's worth mentioning that Germany is actively working on a similar type of structure for India, which would be a pretty big deal given how large of an economy India is, but it's still early days. So to get around to um, China. What I'm referring to with BRI coal here is Belt and Road Initiative coal. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, as most of you probably know, is a huge and nebulous strategic initiative undertaken by China, which um, you know, it's, it's, it's not worth trying to sort of come up with a pithy description, but it's a you know, very large international strategic and financial investment program that encompasses well over 100 countries now. Um, I'm just using BRI, BRI coal as a shorthand for overseas um, coal plants financed by Chinese entities, so outside China, which is not to say that every single one of them is kind of formally part of the BRI, it's just a sort of shorthand. Um, but what do we mean when we're talking about BRI coal? Well, um, part of the reason for uh, China engaging with the BRI in the first place was an attempt to internationalize the activities of its state-owned companies. And most of Chinese, China's economy, um, certainly within the energy sector, is owned and managed by state-owned companies. Some of them have subsidiaries that are listed on stock, on stock exchanges, but uh, in most cases those represent a pretty small share of their assets. But when we're talking about international lending for coal by Chinese entities on the public side, we're mostly talking about the China Development Bank, CDB, and the China Export Import Bank, uh, known as Exim, or some variant of that. And you know, once a deal has been agreed, you'll also see other Chinese state-owned companies come in to provide uh, what's known as EPC contracts, Engineering Procurement Construction. That's basically a sort of turnkey, here's the plant, we'll build it for you, uh, and maintain it, and so on. As well as other SOEs engaged in you know, upstream, downstream, uh, some other financial um, aspect of, of, the, of the contract. Um, 
And on top of that, greening the BRI has uh, for some time now been, at least in government documents in China, quite a high priority. And uh, you can see here on the, on the slides uh, some of the translated versions of the guidance in 2022 documents. The sustainable development of foreign investment, the construction of a green belt and road, and the construction of a new ecological development pattern. Um, I think anyone here who works on, on any uh, documents published by the government in China knows that you should take this with a pretty large pinch of salt, but the direction of travel is quite clear. Um, so what are we looking at in terms of numbers? Um, in the last 10 years, mostly, Chinese entities, again, mostly uh, the CDB or Exim Bank, um, have provided financing for 39 gigawatts of coal power that's currently operating with another 14 gigawatts under construction and another five planned. And this data is as of 2022 with the, uh, the Boston University database that's um, probably the best source that we've got on, on this subject. Um, but as was pointed out in a, a session earlier today, this actually might be an underestimate, particularly in, particularly in Indonesia, um, because uh, it's not completely clear that all of the coal plants um, that have been built are actually being tracked properly particularly uh, captive coal plants, which generally speaking operate off grid and are used to provide power to large industrial facilities, for example. But, you know, they're, they're pretty big numbers. Um, they're also concentrated almost entirely in three countries, Indonesia, Vietnam and Pakistan. You'll also see South Africa on this list. We don't look at it in this study um, because we're mostly looking at South and Southeast Asia. Um, but it is clear that other than those four, um, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and so on are pretty distant seconds. Um, on top of that, in the, particularly in the three, three countries of interest to us, but also in general, um, these plants are very new. They've been built in the last 10 years. Bearing in mind that most coal plants operate for at least 30 years and sometimes 40 or 50, they've got a long way to go before they would be retired normally. Um, and if you do some sort of back of the envelope calculations across this entire fleet, the annual emissions, um, assuming they operate about 65 to 70 percent of the time, is around 200 million tons of CO2 per year. Across the entire fleet, accounting for all of the years left for all of the plants, if you shut them all down right now, you would avoid emitting almost 5 billion tons of, of CO2. And those are not negligible numbers. They're not... Um, you know, on the same scale as, as economy-wide emissions, but it's a pretty big number. And um, if you just take that, that number at the top and multiply it by five, it'll tell you that retiring each of those plants five years early would avoid a gigaton or a billion tons of CO2. So this is probably worth doing. Um, I will go through this quite quickly. Um, it's just some of the detail on the financial model that we built using the estimates that we could get hold of. Um, but I'll spend a little bit of time on the results. Uh, we essentially built a, a discounted cash flow model of a um, hypothetical coal plant with representative characteristics, a subcritical coal plant for the engineers in the room, subcritical meaning um, it's a less efficient technology uh, that's more typically seen with older plants. But actually, to my surprise, when we were looking at the data for this project, most of the BRI coal plants in this study are actually subcritical. Um, and in the model, what we do is take a, a refinancing year, which is basically the year in which you decide to implement a retirement mechanism, bearing in mind that most of these plants are already operating and have been for a number of years, and a retirement year. And those can be different. So let's say it's year five, you decide to refinance in year five, um, refinance being shorthand for implementation of whatever mechanism, and you retire five or ten years after that. So they, you know, they're different things. Um, we have four different retirement scenarios that we look at, one of which is a cash buyout. What that means is essentially someone comes in and they buy the plant at its net present value currently. Um, so that means future uh, cash flows are counted less than present cash flows because future money is worth less. Um, and they, use, they retire the plant immediately. So someone basically takes the hit, whatever it costs, 300 million, 400 million, we'll buy the plant and we'll shut it down immediately. Now that is something that may still happen, um, but we put it there really as a baseline to measure um, the second option, which is uh, a concessional finance option. In this case, rather than uh, just buying out the plant and closing it, 
um, someone comes in and they pay a subsidy uh, to the debt and equity holders that um, allow the entity doing the refinancing to still achieve the expected return and the plant is, is retired early. The way you do that is by refinancing at a lower uh, cost of capital than you had before and you use um, some of the difference between the two to achieve this. Um, we also have carbon finance scenarios. So these are, these are cases in which you account for a value for the avoided emissions um, that are realized if you close down the plant early. Now I'm not saying that there's necessarily a functioning carbon market in any of the countries that we're looking at, there isn't. Um, it's just trying to hypothetically figure out you know, what is the, the um, value on carbon that would, need, would, would be needed to justify um, uh, taking either of these steps. So the, the first flavor is, is what we call a carbon buyout. So this is the future price on avoided carbon that would be needed to justify buying the entire plant out and all of its future cash flows now and retiring it immediately. Um, this is not too different to what's been called a debt for nature swap or a debt for climate swap that the World Bank has been throwing around recently. And actually we've, we've heard anecdotally is also being discussed within China in policy circles. Um, though that sort of thing is very difficult to confirm. And the final one is a concessional carbon finance model where um, we're looking at what would be the avoided carbon price required to pay just the subsidy that's, that's needed in order to retire the plant early. So not buying out the plant entirely, just subsidizing the cash flows to the debt and equity holders. Um, here are some of the inputs and assumptions. Um, we can come back to this if any of you uh, think that these are all completely wrong. But the most important one uh, really is the loan interest rate. So CDB and Exim Bank in China for large infrastructure projects typically lend at actually around 4%. So why have we got 10% here? Well, that 4% is really a base on top of which you get other um, costs like uh, foreign exchange hedging, quite a few other little bits and pieces. And it's not a very precise exercise, but we decided to, to keep to our 10% assumption, at least for the purpose of this modeling. And this is actually coming out as a working paper in the next week or two, and I'll circulate the link once it does. Um, but something that we want to do before we submit it to a journal is to undertake a bit more uh, intensive sensitivity analysis on some of these numbers to figure out, you know, if we're completely wrong on some of them, does it really matter for the key messages of the paper? bearing in mind that these are all estimates or guesstimates based on, on what we know. Um, I'll just skip through this straight to the results. Um, so what we find is that um, taking first of all the, the non-carbon price uh, scenarios where you're just using either a cash buyout or, or concessional finance, if you refinance the plant in year five, so that's the refinancing year, and then retired it in year 10, five years later, it would cost you, um, basically it cost you $184 million to just buy it out in year 10. Uh, but it would cost you $151 million, so about 20% less, to refinance in year 5 and then retire it in year 10. So to achieve the same result, it would actually cost you less money. Um, and this is basically to do with uh, uh, discount rates and differences in costs of capital. That's what generates that difference, because otherwise it all seems, you know, basically the same thing. Um, and the, the, the gap starts to widen in percentage terms the later you wait. So if I did the same, uh, exactly the same thing, but I'm retiring in year 20, it's actually two thirds cheaper just to use a concessional finance route. Now on the carbon prices, the only key and the really important thing to say here is that, um, you know, the numbers you're looking at are actually very, very low. So the, the carbon price that you would need in order to justify doing this is in all cases less than, than $20 a ton. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are kind of familiar with um, uh, carbon pricing, the social cost of carbon. Uh, actually last week, I think the European ETS system for trading um, carbon permits breached 100 euros per ton. So, you know, this is, these are pretty small numbers and not that hard to justify actually, at least from a social point of view. Um, and this basically just shows, shows what I've uh, just explained. Uh, and the, the important thing to mention is that the interest rate subsidy in the way that we've set it up is only possible uh, for years in which um, the, the, the rate of subsidy is less than the total interest rate. So if, if the interest rate is 10% and the subsidy I'm providing covers 9% of that, we can do that. 
but you can't cover 11% of a 10% interest rate. Um, if you did that, you'd have to have both an interest rate subsidy plus an additional grant component, which we can do, we just haven't done it in this paper, um, partly to sort of constrain it to the most realistic scenarios. Um, I'll very quickly go through some, some of the unexpected um, strange shapes that we saw on some of the graphs we generated. But basically, when you're calculating your carbon price, there's one price that you would use to pay off the debt holders and another price that would be used to pay off the equity holders. And what we did actually is, is calculated a single price that can pay off the debt and the equity holders. And without getting into too much detail, um, essentially there are different pressures um, on each of these prices relating to how much of the project is um, held by the debt holder at any particular point in time. So the, the price in carbon is for avoided emissions in the future, but the amount of avoided emissions allocated to debt holders falls over time because you're paying the debt down. And so the carbon price that's required actually rises over time because the amount of avoided emissions in the future available to be monetized falls over time. And the, and the reverse is true for, for equity with a few nuances which explain that inflection point you see around year 19, 18, um, referring to 18 or 19 years of early retirement. Um, but we can come back to this, I think, if it's, if it's of interest. Uh, if you put those two together, what you find, um, and these, this is just a, more of a curiosity than anything else, but it's, it's still quite interesting, is that the longer you wait to retire the plant, the lower the carbon price you actually need to, to do that. Um, there are quite a few different ways of interpreting that, but um, and I don't think we've really thought through exactly what that means yet, but it's still a kind of interesting observation. Um, and I think we want to be completely sure it's not a modeling artifact before we uh, think about the policy implications. So that's some of the refinement work that will go into this paper before it's in journal submission, submission shape. So that's pretty much it on the, on the modeling. I want to spend the next 10-15 minutes talking about political economy, which I think is actually the really important part of this study. Um, and I just want to reinforce that all the numbers I've shown you are indicative, um, but they do suggest that um, you know, at the very least, using something like concessional finance or carbon finance or both is, is a pretty feasible way of getting around this problem. Um, so I'll just go through some kind of basic details on Indonesia, Vietnam and Pakistan and their, the kind of context in which they're operating um, for reasons that will become clear. I'll just kind of limit myself to, to discussing the political economy factors in each case. But um, these, are, these are important because they dictate, you know, yeah, you can do the modeling as long, as long as you want and you can come out with the numbers all day. But unless you've understood what's really going on at the national level and uh, in a historical context, you may be wasting your time. So in Indonesia, Indonesia has abundant domestic coal resources. They're relatively cheap to extract. They're not particularly high quality. Uh, a lot of them are exported to China, which is relevant in the context of the wider trade relationship. Um, but by and large, um, the government or the, the government's actions are dependent on uh, the backing of key political and economic elites, both in the state-owned monopoly, PLN, the utility firm, but also um, the, the kind of oligarchic control of coal resources. Um, for quite a, long, quite a long time now, Coal has become a growing component of um, national and local budgets that uh, has kind of created a preference to stick with the status quo. And on top of that, the, um, the China-backed BRI coal plants in Indonesia are not only protected by something called the in Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which protects investors against adverse policy action by governments, but also by another specific treaty called the China ASEAN Treaty, um, that you know, provides additional protection to investors in China-backed units um, in the country as well. Uh, in Pakistan, the situation is actually much more dire. In fact, um, the, the government of Pakistan has actually just uh, indicated that it's going to go for another coal push, um, having done so about five years ago, partly as a result of the turmoil in energy markets and the cost of gas, um, particularly LNG at the moment. And it turns out that the Pakistani government didn't have any uh, hedging or long-term contracts. They were buying gas on the spot market, which um, seemed like a good idea for a while, but it's now put the government in, unfortunately, a very, very difficult position where um, 
it needs uh, additional electricity capacity very quickly, as cheaply as possible. So not only is, is early retirement not really on the agenda in Pakistan, the government is actively considering an expansion of coal-fired power. In Vietnam, um, it's a bit more nuanced of a situation insofar as um, so the way, the way Vietnam plans its power sector is through eight year long plans, not too different to China's five year plans. Um, and the second to last one was pretty pro fossil fuels and the most recent draft of it is actually pretty pro renewables. Um, there's a lot of attention on Vietnam at the moment as, as one of the countries in which the jet P approach may take off. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't say that, that pro-renewable, pro-transition policy is necessarily um, here to stay in Vietnam. It's not necessarily credible, but there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of indications that you know, there may be room to maneuver. So um, what ties all these contexts together is very rapidly growing electricity demand, uh, a major role for coal in the generation profile nationally, a pretty weak financial outlook for coal, um, which is not entirely true now, given where coal, gas and renewable prices are relatively at the moment. But generally speaking, in the medium long term, there's a lot of competition from cheaper renewables. Fuel costs are relatively high and load factors, meaning the amount of time per year that a coal plant is operating are relatively low. And of course, in, in all of these countries, there are long term national policy goals and a need to attract a huge amount of investment to meet them. Um, some of the key differences, Vietnam has invested in solar expansion to an extent the other two have not. Um, and Vietnam has, to a certain extent, a more advanced discussion or policy framework around retirement that Indonesia and certainly Pakistan do not. Um, so what does this all mean? I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but we can come back to it in, in Q&A. Um, the long and the short of it is if you take a, um, in this case, what's called the Act Objective Context Framework for analyzing um, the political economy of a, of a country with respect to a certain issue or of a, of a kind of political community. Um, what we find is that, you know, it, the, the, the key message really is that if coal retirement is going to happen in any of these countries, it's extremely unlikely to be on the initiative of the national government. Uh, meaning the host country, meaning the governments of Indonesia, Pakistan and Vietnam. Um, the reason that's relevant here is that the, the country, I mean, I'm, I'm using that term quite hesitantly, but I think it's probably quite accurate in this case because the lending is almost entirely by um, Chinese development banks. Um, the country with, with, that's holding all the cards is China. Um, and interestingly enough, what our analysis shows is that um, although you do have a preponderance of, of elites and oligarchic forces in most of the in all of these countries, actually, um, those those same elites may see uh, external restructuring of, of infrastructure from a financial point of view as an acceptable way and a legitimate and politically secure way of um, allowing the allowing them to retain their role in growing, growing the energy system while also phasing out coal. And this is not to take an ethical point of view on this, by the way. And I'm, I am absolutely, I don't think any of my co-authors would, would advocate for, um, you know, a situation where the coal barons in Indonesia are just getting paid off completely 100%. But we're just kind of working through the options because if you take as, as an objective a view as possible, um, you know, it, it seems that unless there is significant political change in these countries, if you want to achieve this in the short term, this is something that you will have to take account of. Um, so our conclusion really is that foreign capital, in this case, Chinese foreign capital, will most likely be the one that has to pay for coal phase out in some shape or form, given the, the need to maintain the stability of, um, of the kind of political patrons in, in these countries. Again, that's more of a sort of realism based approach rather than necessarily something that anyone would want to see. But um, a lot of the material that comes out of the, um, the, the kind of more Western financial institutions and development banks and so on tends to not really address these issues. Um, so it really is important to talk about them. Uh, so just to, to wrap up in the next couple of minutes, um, if we are going to engage uh, Chinese institutions in early retirement, and you know, part of the, the part of the audience for this work is actually 
uh, managers in Chinese SOEs and, and state banks, and also to an extent um, uh, Communist Party officials. Uh, if, if, if this is going to depend, depend on Chinese institutions, um, either concessions from Chinese lenders, meaning that you know, CDB or Exim Bank is willing to accept a lower return on assets than it had previously, or a transfer of those assets to another institution, which could be a vehicle set up by China expressly for the purpose of buying up and retiring coal plants, or it could be another fund capitalized by you know, the World Bank, the UK, Germany, etc., etc., as per the, the JetB mechanism, um, as long as China is willing to sell its coal plants to, to you know, the West broadly defined, which is perhaps quite unlikely. Um, but it's also worth bearing in mind that you know, for Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan to transition to renewables, if they're going to do that, most of the stuff they will need to buy and import and the infrastructure they'll need to build, all that sort of thing will come overwhelmingly from China. So there may be a win-win um, or at least a lose-win situation um, for China here. What might actually work? Well, um, either the, the banks or the Chinese government directly is willing to renegotiate on the terms of existing loans, and there is precedent for that across other BRI projects. The extent to which they're willing to do that uh, and you know, how well that aligns with the costs of the results of the model that I outlined earlier is a bit of an open question. Transferring coal assets to new entities. Again, China has done this many times domestically in the early 2000s, for example. There was a huge steel overcapacity in the country. And um, among some of the measures taken by the Chinese government was to set up a dedicated bad bank or bad asset manager to take care and wind down, of, wind down all of the kind of underperforming assets. So there's experience with doing this. And then thirdly is the option I already mentioned, which is transferring the asset to an kind of international blended finance fund, which is conditional on China being willing to sell the assets. Who should, who is well placed to do this? Well, Chinese DFIs or development finance institutions are well placed to do this, both on the debt side through debt for nature or debt for climate swaps or simply just a concessional instrument. Um, and then on the equity side, actually, Chinese DFIs have shareholdings in about two dozen um, overseas development funds that have already been set up, some of which already have kind of green targets or sustainability goals. And those sort of entities are really ideal um, to either pool capital for the use of interest rate subsidies, as I discussed earlier, or to buy and hold um, coal power assets with the intention of closing them down. So there are ways in which this can be done. Uh, I think I've probably already summed all of this up, so I'll just kind of go through this. Um, and finally, uh, some of the further questions that we'll be exploring in future work, or some of my colleagues will, is, and this is really, these are really critical questions and have been, you know, for example, in the case of Germany, there's a big public debate on uh, the extent to which public money has been used to pay uh, utilities that own coal-fired power plants on the basis they are not economic now, they're not going to be economic in the future. The utilities knew that, but they came up with inflated values for them. You know, this, is, this kind of moral hazard problem is a real issue in all of the contexts I've discussed as well, potentially. So how much should, should the coal plant owners be compensated, if at all? Who should meet those costs? Um, what, I haven't really discussed this in any detail, but in, in um, in the context of kind of geo strategy and geo economic investments, and um, you know China's wider footprint and, and uh, access to resources, a single coal plant is usually part of a much larger package of investments, which may include you know railway lines. It could include a football stadium or soccer stadium, as you say in America. Um, some of which may be explicitly designed to lose money. So it's it's generally speaking part of a much wider strategic. Um, set of investments and that should really be accounted for when you're thinking about which which plants um, you should target first for early retirement um, and then how I, I seem to have written half a question here but um, how should proponents of coal phase out approach this problem I think what we've tried to do in this paper is to provide some avenues for uh, potential success or at least being able to start a conversation um, ideally with Chinese stakeholders on on doing something about this. Um, but our hope is that it's at least additional to the existing conversations out there. So I know that's been a lot of material. Um, thank you very much for listening and look forward to your questions.
Alex, that was great. A little coercive uh, global political economy focused on energy transitions, I would say. Uh, any questions from our uh, in-house audience? We now have about seven, eight, ten uh, questions. All right. Hi, Alex. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just had a question about kind of the terminology of phase out. Um, and like on the last slide, you had phase out. So one of our last speakers, his name was Arthur Lee, and he had been at some of the UN COPs and whatnot. Um, and he essentially told us that, you know, one of the last times he was there, some of the Chinese representatives kind of staunchly opposed the term phase out and preferred phase down. Um, so just in thinking about the role that they have to play in the refinancing, I, I'm curious about a little bit more on your perspective of their perspective. <laughs> where, where, the, where do they stand right now? That's a really good question. Um, do you want to gather a couple more or, or should we just do one at a time? Okay, I'll just keep going if that's okay. So you're absolutely right. Um, one of the real sticking points of the last COP was exactly this use of terminology, phase out versus phase down. Um, and I've actually encountered this directly with another paper that I was due to present uh, at a symposium held with a Chinese entity and I was emailed 12 hours before to say, no, you can't talk about this because it was looking at employment and it was looking at phase out within China. The open question is how China uses that terminology vis-a-vis -vis overseas investments, because it's an extremely politically sensitive issue within China. Um, but my, my impression is, you know, it, would, it wouldn't actually decrease the, you know, I, I would be perfectly willing to swap out that terminology, actually, if it was able to, to um, get this show on the road. I don't think it, I think it's really semantics in this case. And it's important to bear in mind, though, there is actually a very valid point underlying the whole debate over coal phase out and phase down, which is in for a lot of these countries, particularly ones I've talked about, there is no realistic way currently of meeting the demands, the electricity demands of their populations without some form of coal. Um, even if the intention is to get off coal as soon as practically possible, that's not something that happens overnight. And it doesn't happen without you know, a serious amount of time and money invested in institutions and, in, and vehicles for doing so. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the interaction between like China and then the national governments um, of like Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan. Um, and if there was a move like for Indonesia, for example, they have made a lot of commitments to phase out coal to reach net zero by 2060. Um, certainly just commitments right now. And so still need to figure out how it's going to happen. But I was curious on if there was enough pressure or interest coming from inside the country if they would have the power to, um, to you know, buy out these assets from China or kind of like what does that power relationship look like between China and the national governments? So I, I think it really depends on the case and sometimes it depends on the individual power plant. So we do have quite a lot of vi visibility thanks to the work of BU over um, who owns the debt associated with these plants. We sometimes know who owns the equity. The picture on you know, private uh, investors is much, much murkier and, and hard to get hold of, particularly if those investors are Chinese. Um, so let, let's, just let's just take a case in which you know, the ch there's a Chinese institution that's provided the debt, but in all other respects, it's kind of backed by a domestic entity. Um, I think for the reasons that we've outlined, it's unlikely that the, um, the domestic entity whether it's at the government level or whether it's the uh, state-owned power company, for example, like PLN in Indonesia's case, it's pretty unlikely to be the initiator of the conversation. Not least because there are so many other priorities, but just that they're not in a position to uh, necessarily, they're not in a very strong negotiating position. And historically, you know, um, China has been very unwilling to um, engage with other multilateral, well, multilateral development banks particularly, and you know, the OECD world in general on um, uh, renegotiating debt. But in, in bilateral relations with specific countries, particularly those that are under debt distress, which applies to a lot of these cases, they have been. Um, so it really depends on you know, what precedent there is for, for you know, chi the Chinese lender taking a haircut on a particular project or not. Um, probably the context of the wider relationship but yeah, it's, it's hard to comment in, in general, but um, you know, I think, honestly, we've done a pretty superficial analysis here, to be honest, but um, it would be well worthwhile going into really real detail on the histories of these relationships to try and figure out you know, what the best tactics would be 
to get a conversation started. That was a bit of a roundabout answer, but I, I hope it was helpful. Uh, yeah, just um, on this point of replacing uh, capacity, right? Uh, this idea that these countries don't have a whole lot of other options than coal. Um, have you looked into or how do you think that the numbers might change with that carbon price if you also included the sort of subsidizing the cost of the capital to replace that capacity with coal alternatives? Like how mm. much would that raise the, uh, the carbon price that you guys found? Um, that's a good question. So I think, you know, you'd probably need to treat that as an additional grant component or something where, you know, you've got a 10% interest rate, but you're pro actually providing a subsidy of 15% partly to help retry, retire the coal plant early and partly to uh, provide upfront cash to invest in new renewable capacity. Um, or you could divert a share of the, the funding freed up through the, through the concessionality mechanism or carbon pricing mechanism and you know, direct some of that towards funding early retirement and some of it towards um, renewables. But yeah, it would raise the carbon price. But I'm not sure. It's really worth thinking about. I'm not sure that's um, the way in which I'd frame it, to be honest, because, you know, renew it, it, kinda, it can get quite quickly get confusing in policymakers' heads to put those two things together. Um, so, you know, they are kind of sides of the same coin, but I wouldn't necessarily bundle the renewable capacity addition stuff into the carbon pricing discussion. Um, but, you know, it's something we haven't thought about, so thanks for the suggestion. We'll think about it uh, as we develop the work. Hey Alex, thank you for your presentation. Um, there's been a lot of rhetoric lately, especially in the United States, on economic naturalism, particularly considering Chinese investments. Do you foresee that being any sort of barrier to your plans or your targets? Um, oh, that's a loaded question, right, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, clearly the 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 at the level of sort of technology and collaboration and infrastructure, the nature of the conversation between the US and China is deeply unproductive at the moment. Um, there might be some good reasons for that. I think there are some bad reasons for that that are really to do with, you know, um, nothing that really has any basis in fact sometimes. Um, but actually, for looking at, at, these, at this particular case, yes, it might close off the avenue where China might be willing to sell some coal assets to a blended fund that's got some Western institutions or countries backing it. But I think we've shown that, you know, China has the capacity and probably the self-interest to do this completely without involving anybody else. And that, you know, that is still a hypothesis and it's something that we're trying to test by sending this paper to people we think might be willing to tell us what they actually think in the Chinese government. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, yeah, one of the positive conclusions is that you don't necessarily need Western participation to make this work. Yeah, the best thing that could happen is they could read your paper and then decide it's such a good idea. It was their idea in the first place for the way you described it. All this <laughs> We're just about uh, out of time for the public questions. Uh, Alex is going to stay and talk to the student group uh, afterwards. So, uh, Alex, thanks for opening our eyes to, for most of us, a brand new dimension to global energy transition planning in search of sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you.